Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's free webinar, Pitch Decks That Work, Creating a Winning Pitch Deck, with Mark Phillips from RFR Ventures, Jim Fulton from Cooley, and Cirque Rowe from Early Growth Financial Services. I'm Erica Mausberg, Chief Marketing Officer for Early Growth Financial Services, and I'm going to be your moderator for this webinar. Um, the presentation itself is going to run about 40 minutes, so we're hoping we'll have a lot of time for Q&A. If you have questions as we go through the presentation, don't just raise your hand. Please feel free to go ahead and enter them in the question field. We'll answer them as they come if we can, or we'll wait until the end at the Q&A to address them. And if we run out of time, we'll try to follow up with an email um, individually to each of you with questions to make sure that everything's been answered. You're also free to tweet questions um, after this presentation to at EarlyGrowthFS, and you can use the hashtag WinningPitch, and we'll respond via Twitter to those. Um, and also, you'll all be receiving an email tomorrow with a link to the slide deck and a recording, so you'll be able to review all the content that we go through. So I want to start today by introducing our presenters. Um, first, we're honored to have with us Mark Phillips. Mark is a managing partner at RFR Ventures, a Silicon Valley-based micro-venture fund focused on technology startups and early-stage companies. He's also the author of a fantastic book called Inside Silicon Valley, How the Deals Get Done. If you haven't already, you should definitely check it out for its great insights into the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. We also have with us today Jim Fulton. Jim's a partner in the Emerging Companies Practice Group at Cooley. Jim focuses on representing both emerging and established technology, healthcare, and biotech companies and the venture capital firms that invest in those companies. Concentrating in corporate and securities law, he counsels companies throughout their life cycle on matters ranging from company formations, private financings, employee equity incentives, and executive hiring, to complex spin-outs, mergers and acquisitions, IPOs, and SEC reporting and compliance. In the last 10 years alone, Jim has worked on more than 350 venture capital transactions, raising more than $4 billion. We also have with us today Cirque Rowe. Cirque is the Chief Operating Officer for Early Growth Financial Services. He has 25 years of finance experience with 17 years serving in financial leadership roles with high-tech companies. He's an accomplished finance executive focused on leading early stage companies through strategic financial decision, decisions. Um, so before we go ahead and jump into the content, I um, just want to say welcome to you guys. And maybe, Cirque, if we could start, can you just say a few words about Early Growth Financial Services? Sure. Thank you, Erica, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I work with Early Growth Financial Services. We are a, a national um, outsourced financial and accounting um, services firm. And so we work with small and mid-sized companies, and for a lot of us, that means um, uh, tech startups. Um, and we provide basically four types of services. We do tax returns for tax returns. We do uh, 409A valuations for companies who are uh, providing stock options to their employees. We do transactional uh, financial and accounting and bookkeeping. Um, that's the day-to-day, -day, week week-to-week, uh, and month-to-month -month, uh, financial um, and accounting assistance, including a hard monthly close of the financials every month. And then we provide higher-level CFO slash controller-level services um, for companies on an as-needed basis. And that's for things like you know, budgeting and financial planning and helping with, with fundraising and looking at bank versus uh, equity um, and, and, and other um, activities like that. And we do provide all this on, a, on an as-needed um, hourly basis as opposed to, you know, monthly minimums or retainer fees. So it works really, really well for early stage companies who don't have the, the, the need for uh, a lot of support or full-time people. Wonderful. Well, thanks for joining us today, sir. And uh, Jim, can you say a few words about Cooley? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cooley is one of the leading firms in the country, if not the world, representing uh, innovative startup companies, uh, not just in their startup and seed and, and venture financing activities, but uh, IPOs, M&A, and beyond. Um, we've been a firm for nearly 100 years, formed the first uh, venture capital firm on the West Coast, and have been uh, an integral part of the innovation ecosystem ever since. I'm um, looking forward to sharing some of my insights with everyone here today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, so before we dig in, I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Mark, and he can uh, first say a few words about himself and RFR Ventures, and then jump right into the presentation. So welcome, Mark. Uh, thanks, Eric. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, started out in Australia uh, as an entrepreneur and um, moved to America about 14 years ago uh, after selling my first uh, startup company. And so I've lived here in Palo Alto for about 14 years and 
together with my partner, we run a, a small uh, operator uh, venture fund, and you know, we write checks in the vicinity uh, of about half a million dollars, and you know, in a seed round, and uh, about the same, if not more, into the Series A. A couple of years ago, I wrote a book uh, called Inside Silicon Valley to break down an investment debt from and explain it from both an entrepreneur's and a venture capitalist perspective. Um, having you know raised money before uh, and now investing in companies, I found it very difficult to find any um, book or guideline that gave me the right methodology of um, what to put into which presentations in an investment pitch deck. So I decided to just ring 20 of my uh, uh, portfolio companies or people I knew and ask them if I could borrow a, a slide from their investment deck and explain it. Um, and, and so this presentation draws on some of the uh, companies from the book which have raised money and I hope to give you some insights. If you're working on a pitch deck, I think it's timely so you can um, you can improve it and hopefully you know, fulfill your dream. Just some of the companies we've invested in, um, mainly software, mainly B2B, um, and so yeah, just to give you some ideas on um, the types of companies that we we invest in. Um, so, uh, what are the investment pitch deck essentials? Um, how to make a great deck? Uh, you know, there's probably between 10 and 15 slides that go into an investment pitch deck. Um, more than that, I think venture capitalists and investors uh, you know, think about a pitch deck as in half hour or hour blocks. Um, and so you've got to fit it in to their time frame. That's really important. And so this morning I thought I would take a leaf from my own hymn book and try and get through this presentation with the help of Cirque and, and Jim. Um, in, in sort of half an hour of leaving time for questions. Um, so, you know, I think I think the tough part about an investment pitch deck is the first slide because it's really the impact, right? Um, impressions, first impressions matter. And so I always uh, encourage entrepreneurs to have three things on the first slide of their pitch deck, and that is obviously the company name. Um, a logo or uh, uh, an image of what you do, and then a positioning line. And think about you know the Silicon Valley speak of this slide is what is it? It's the elevator pitch. You know, very quickly in the first 15, 20 seconds or less, you can explain, uh, frame it up, set uh, the expectations of the investors or venture capitalists on what your company is, uh, what it does, and perhaps you know, what market it's in, and uh, this is a good slide. Um, the next slide is, is a similar uh, slide number one, um, invested in this in this startup, and I love the, the, the front page. It, it, you know, it's emotive, um, it sort of defines just by pictorially a big market, um, and, and there's a sense of excitement. So. I think one of the things that you want to get across to your investors very quickly is that you are in, you know, what I call investment ready, um, and having a good pitch deck is, is the start of that. And the first slide, like a book, you know, um, you, you've got to you've got to capture people's attention. I often think, you know, I go past movie posters uh, on, and, and I think, wow, you know, is that capturing my attention? And, and there's parallels between those movie posters you see and your pitch deck. I always think the next best slide to start with, if the investors don't know you, is who you are, who's the management team. Um, and you know, because often you're not in front of them, you may have to send your deck in, uh, or you're talking over the phone. So you know, putting a face to the name is just simple. And often this slide goes in the back of the deck. Uh, but if you don't know the investors, definitely put it up front. Um, there may be only the CEO and the CTO. Uh, talking or the co-founders and there are other people that bring you know, credibility to the pitch. Um, 
And so I feel that you know having a strong uh, a strong slide after you've told them what they do, even before you get into the solution and the problem, is is uh, is good setting of the meeting. Yeah, and then just to amplify, this is Jim on that point, which is I think uh, especially entrepreneurs at the earlier stage, um, I don't think uh, appreciate um, that the, the 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 team's pedigree and and the how broad the team is and skills is is a huge um, huge issue for most investors because you know there, there's there's only so many different kind of risks to take and you're obviously taking generally technology risk um, when you're investing in an early stage technology company um, and you're convincing yourself if you're an investor that the market risk is is not great because it's a big market and and you believe that this can this can address it but then you end up in a situation where um, you find that um, if the team can't execute on that idea or the, or the investors don't believe that the team can execute, that's when you have a real problem. Exactly. And to follow up on that, um, on Jim's point is, uh, you know, this is, I know, Brandon actually got introduced to me by a, another venture firm. And I didn't know a ton about this sort of, you know, cloud security market. But when you see that there are other experts uh, and management on the deck that come from similar companies in that field, it definitely just reiterates that the founder um, has got support not just for, from great people but for his vision. So we have a question here from so, from Jen, and um, she wants to know what what if you don't have such a pedigree? What if there are gaps in your management team? How would you address that? To Jim's point. Um, it's definitely about the stage of the company, and you know, obviously, this, this company had been funded a little bit uh, by a seed round, uh, so to put it in perspective. But uh, you know, later in the slide, we talk about having an advisory slide, which is you know, you provide some stock options out to advisors, and so I'll, I'll come back to that. But uh, they're the they're the two: it's management or or advisors. But you know, we all have to start somewhere, right? So, you know, these guys obviously from their pedigree you can see they've been around um, younger entrepreneurs. Yeah, and I would say that the, my direct answer to, to the question would be I wouldn't put slide two that it's just you or just you and one other person. Um, I would I would be honest about the holes you needed to fill, but I think we'll cover that later um, in, in this kind of a deck. Okay, great, thanks. So the slide number two, you know, all three of the management slides in there is is keep it really simple, the problem we solve. And there are often multiple problems. Um, I don't think you want to start talking about, you know, the long history of how you came up with, you know, the, identifying the problem. Just state the problem. And state it state it simply uh, and, and keep it just to one problem, you know. And now, I always sort of think of it the aha moment. It's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. I have that problem. So if you can try and you know assimilate the problem that is happening to to a, a real world scenario, that makes sense. But just a really simple slide, no complications, and know there's ten problems, and we're trying to solve one. There will be multiple problems, but I just keep it to the core or the key problem. And that allows you very quickly to move on to the next slide, which is you know how we solve the problem, right? What is what is um, sort of our solution? Now, here's a slide um, of an e-commerce retailer, and you can just compare both slides. One is really simple, and the other one is I've got five buckets or placeholders of information, and I've got to process all of this. And so you naturally start to think, okay, what's the story on this slide? And so, you know, I think it's it's just worthy to check your pitch deck and make sure that the problem slide in itself is really simple to understand. And the solution, um, you know, I try and encourage entrepreneurs to get through the first slide, the second slide, the problem to the solution within a couple of minutes. And why? Because as 
investors and entrepreneurs, but you know, we want to know what, what it is. Show us the, the bright, shiny new thing, as I often call it. Um, and so I think you know, seeing at this point in the in the pitch deck, you want to show something, and that's three forms. One, it's a screen capture of your software. Uh, it's a piece of hardware. So you pull it out of your bag and put it on the table. Uh, or if it's an app, you pull up your mobile device and, and you show it. And I think that that is a great um, you know that is a, a great way uh, to think about the solution slide. It's showing and not so much telling. Obviously, you know, if you if you pre-production or pre-alpha, you can't do that. But um, you know, and then I think that's just a natural segue into a demonstration. I always say to entrepreneurs, demo it, pull it up, give people a thirty-second look, log in to the to the dashboard. You know, create, um, you know, install the app on their phone. Or let them play with it. Let them physically, tangibly touch what you've created, what your solution is. Now, I'm not talking about going into you know a, a 10 minute. This is how our software works, right? Because you want to at this point explain the user case, right? You want to say, imagine you are a mid tier, you know. Uh, CTO and you're in the financial services sector and you've got this problem. Right? So you want to at the solution stage start to focus in on this is how a user interacts with our solution and give real examples. Um, often the, the solution can be quite complicated. There's a lot of you know mechanics involved, and I think just you know very clear, where it's a, a big technology play. And it's quite complicated. You want to start breaking it out. And I use this slide a lot because it explains three things. One, break up bits of information. Put you know images or logos with arrows. So you start to just take the user through a flow on the slide. Um, and so um, we move on to the market size, and you know, we often. Obviously, we want to know what how big the market is, and you know, companies like Early Growth and other your accountants, and they can help you with this math, um, as, as as accountants can. And so, you you know, we never invest in a company if the market size is less than five billion. And so, you want to kind of do the math. This is not the prettiest slide, but it, for illustrative purposes, it makes perfect sense. It's what's my you know, how many people can I potentially buy my product or service? Um, you know, of those, what would they pay, or what do they spend on similar um, types of products and services? What percentage of that market could I get? And that becomes, um, you know, your addressable market. So, on the next slide, you'll see that there's a couple of um, there's a couple of ways to think about the market slide, um, and, and feel free, sir, to in or gene, you know, there's there might be a total market, like the global um, market for for you know um, wearable computing is X, but really our you know our serviceable market is the United States because we're here and that's what we're selling to first. But before we go nationwide, we're actually just going to start in the you know in the women's apparel, and I saw a pitch deck last week that was putting you know. Um, wireless devices into women's jewelry. And so I would say that would be the initial market opportunity is, you know, a segment based on demographic, um, you know, whether it's age, interest, or other sort of psychographics. Um, but it is an important concept. You want to get across that um, you do understand how big the market is. Obviously venture capitalists want to do the math and think Wow! If they got one or two percent of this multi-billion-dollar opportunity, that could be a big company. That's what we're doing at this stage. Where we're not just thinking, "Are these guys going to hit it out of the park?" But we want some quanti you know, quantity, a uh, quantification uh, numbers to justify our investment thesis. Yeah, and, you know, this, and, and, this more, is... and more more so, I think, than just showing them it's a big market, because this slide's a good example. If you just showed them a $33.9 million number, 
the, 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 the unanswered question is going to be, yeah, right, but what percentage of that is really reachable by them? And if you haven't answered that question, I think you definitely have lost some credibility, even if you can answer it in, 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 as part of a follow-up question, because you're immediately on the defensive where they're thinking you, you, know, you exaggerated the number and it's really not what your addressable market is. So demonstrating to them in a slide format that you've been thoughtful about what the true market size is, particularly initially, I think is another great credibility builder. Yeah, and, and, and this is Sirk, and I'll, I'll add something else to this as well. And, and I think that you know, um, the, the, the points that uh, the market you make are absolutely spot on in terms of you know, really, really um, uh, honing in on a particular niche that you're going after. Right? You, you as entrepreneurs of early stage companies um, need to be um, laser focused. Um, you're not going to be able to go after a huge market initially, but to the extent that you can kind of you know, plant the seed in the investor's mind of, you know, with, you know, once we actually are able to be successful in this market, then it's going to be an easy extension um, into other verticals and other markets, and, and, and that's kind of when the opportunity starts get, to get really, really interesting um, and exciting, um, then I think that you'll, you'll, you know, do a better job of piquing the interest of, of the investors. And then also, this slide dovetails nicely into the, your eventual go-to-market slide and your financial. And so, you know, you tie a bow around the market size, the initial market size, and how much money you're raising, and then, you know, what your financial forecasts are, and then, you know, you're going to step it up in the next round and the next round. Because obviously, a lot of VCs, us included, we don't want to invest in, a, in an angel, we're not angel investors, we want to follow up our seed investment into a Series A, sometimes even a Series B. Um, and so a lot of VCs want to hear this follow-on story, they want to hear that the market has um, you know, an initial, a serviceable and a large total uh, size as well. So that's the, uh, the market uh, size. Uh, just to Jim's point as well, it's probably the first slide in the pitch deck that you start as a venture capital realizing, you know, are these two great engineers and product guys, are they business people as well? Do they understand, you know, economics of, of, of a big market? And so I think that's important to, to, uh, to take on board. Slide five, um, you've shown them the solution, you've told them how big the market is, they're probably excited now. Uh, hopefully, and you start saying, okay, this is really how it works. So I always call this the lifting the hood slide. It's, let me tell you how the architecture of our technology or product works. Right? We've got servers, we've got middleware, we've got nodes, we've got you know wind farms, we've got, um, you know, that's the important sort of spatial pictorial that people want to see. They, You've now excited them and they might be holding the app, playing with the app, looking at the dashboard and they want to understand what's behind it at, a, you know, at an architecture technology stack level. Um, another way on the next slide, another way to, to look at this slide is really how it works. You know, what's behind it? Uh, is it in this case, it was, you know, you'll see those, um, those silos. Uh, underneath the dashboard. I like this slide because you've got the dashboard and then you've got the architecture, the engine behind it or underneath it, the API, the algorithm. This is how it all fits together. So in giving the investor not just the product and how it looks on top, but what's under the hood, how it all ties together. And another slide just uh, in a, in a Pitch deck these guys raised a couple of million dollars a few months ago. Um, very simple, um, you know, cloud, a couple of arrows, an SDK, an iPhone, a server. Okay, this is how it works. So again, keeping it simple, talking about a user's perspective during this slide is important. This is actually a, a slide that uh, was in a company I was involved with and um, you know I want to talk a little bit about this there's three things so the VCs are sitting there saying great solution huge market wow great technology stack how scalable how defensible where's the sizzle where's the IP and so you know intellectual property is 
often explained in a diagram. It's like our IP is between these particular points, the, the browser and you know, and our software, or it's in, you know, it's embedded in a particular algorithm. So you know, architecture IP also makes it defensible. Wow, this is really complicated. We have deep domain expertise. It can't be replicated easily, right? And also at the same time, you can explain how and why it's scalable. Um, and so I think you know, IP is something I just wanted to um, turn over to Jim and talk a little bit about. Um, obviously, IP is really important. The earlier companies um, find it more important because their product hasn't been built out. So um, you know, I think having a good attorney uh, that understands an I your IP needs and can put together a strategy because obviously we like to defend our investment as most VCs do by having some sort of pattern that are put in place. Um, so speaking to that in the investment pitch is important as well, Jim. Yeah, and I, I think first and foremost, though, that you, you're right in that you definitely have to explain where the differentiation is. Um, it, you know, some people don't even think of it as intellectual property, um, and I actually think um, you're better off thinking about it from, you know, what's the sizzle, um, you know, as Mark phrases it, what, where's the differentiator, and then backing it up with how that sizzle, how you're going to be able to defend that sizzle, what are the barriers to entry. And for that, you know, sometimes it might be patent protection. Other times, it's not. It's going to be um, uh, trademark protection or service mark protection combined with some, you know, form of trade secrets. But um, when you're describing your intellectual property, I think you want to do it as as um, concisely and as specifically as you can. But focus it around. I mean, the fact that you have 14 patents is, as a bullet point is not particularly interesting. If you have um, uh, 14 patents, three of which protect the core architecture, and and 11 of which you know surround you is a good descriptive way. But again, your um, counsel who's helping you on IP matters, I think, can help you figure out how best to market the IP aspects of your of your business. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, and so, you know, at this juncture, I thought I'd just sort of take a break and say, okay, let's let's kind of think about some pitch tips um, as before you're arriving at the meeting or if you're rehearsing with your founder. Um, you know, I think my first point, I reiterate, try and select investors that will re-up um, because it's easier to, to raise money if insiders are, are going to invest again. Some of the things that are, are you know, a lot of VCs, how many of the angel investors or the first round investors are re-upping? Because you know, it shows support. <coughs> um, in, in a meeting, you know, short sentences, not technical speak, don't go into long-winded explanations, stop yourself. right? Um, and you know, investors watch body language, it's not just about what you say, it's how you say it. Um, so you know, a, a quick cheat sheet is available online on body language. Um, you know, using hands, eye contact, um, you know, hesitating. So we look for these these things. If, if founders are in sync or not, are they agreeing with each other? Uh, I often like to keep a, a consistent pace in a presentation. Um, again, you know, you've got 12, 15 slides. Give it two minutes each. If you think about 15 times two is 30 minutes. Um, you know, control your emotions. Be prepared for conflict. Um, you know, the VC might uh, throw out there a, a question that challenges you, and you know, or or they might be really knowledgeable, but more knowledgeable than you in many cases. Um, and so they'll challenge your assumptions. It goes back to well, we don't know everything. We're looking for guidance as much as your money. Um, so being aware of that sort of a, you know your emotional what I call the emotional timeline um, and defer to your you know your founders or your partner in the meeting um, and and play and and rehearse that role play um, and more importantly connect with analogies and anecdotes in the real world um, you know, if if you've got a medical device or you've got some you know laser uh, space laser architecture you've got to 
bring it down to real life examples as well. And probably the best tip I've ever heard and one I give out the most is, you know, VCs invest in two of the three things, team, market size, product fit. And you've always got to sort of reiterate through your pitch deck we've got these three or we've got two and we're looking for the third, right? So great team, huge market, product needs to fit a little bit more or we've got, you know, not not the greatest team and that's why we need your money to get better staff um, and our product's awesome because and we need to get global. But there's some tips there. No, I'll, I'll add a couple points to that to, to this as well. Um, one is actually on the pitch deck itself, and and I think that this this presentation is a perfect example of that, um, notwithstanding this this one slide. And and that is to the extent that you can um, really keep the message, really keep the word wording simple, right, and and large and short, right, and to, and where you can replace words with graphics and charts. I think you can see on this slide deck that, that most of this is, is in chart form or in graphics form. And I think that that's a much, much better presentation uh, to give to investors. The other, the other thing that, um, that I've seen uh, some companies uh, make errors on is that um, is, is let the best picture pitch. Right, and so you know, we're we're you know, you may be a co-founding team of two or three. The initial person um, who actually thought of the idea and really started the company might be a technologist, um, and 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 you may be the CEO of the company, and you may be thinking, oh, I'm the CEO, I'm the one who came up with the idea, I'm the one who needs to pitch this, and that's absolutely not the right way of looking at it. You got to be looking at it in terms of which is the best team member on the on the team to actually make that pitch. Yeah, no, this is Jim, and one other item um, that I would say is really important when you're at the pitch is you, you should have anticipated what the questions are going to be. Your, your slide deck uh, should hopefully um, already have answered through the slides the most um, sort of common set of questions that you've encountered so that you don't have to actually turn it into answering a question. Um, but naturally, there's going to be follow-up questions. and. The tone of how you answer the question um, it should be sincere and, and candid as opposed to either defensive or sort of, oh, that's not a problem or, or they're not a real competitor. One of the comical ones I get when people start talking, about, you know, and we'll talk about it in, in, in a different slide, I think, you know, that, oh, there's nobody doing it like this way. Well, that's not true. There's always competitors. I mean, it's doing exactly the way you do it. but. Dismissing your competitors with a, a wave of the hand is likely to lead to an investor dismissing you with a wave of the hand. So having thoughtful answers to what will be the most common questions is a really good way to leave a positive impression with the, the folks you're pitching. A question here from Lee. Um, he wants to know if you suggest having the board directors or advisors um, members attend the pitch meeting. Yeah, I, I mean every situation is different, um, but I mean I regularly attend, uh, you know, finance meetings with uh, our portfolio companies. Um, it's not common that you know investors attend uh, pitches, but they may make a warm introduction. So it's it's, uh, it's not mandatory, but uh, you know if you feel you need that support um, and they can add value in the meeting, meeting great. Um, but one of the things you don't want to do is is sort of think very clearly about whether or not the investor uh, might feel that you don't have the capability of all the confidence. Uh, to to execute, and that's why you're bringing a board member along. Okay, we have a, we have a couple other questions here on, on this slide. So if you don't mind, but we'll just go through a few of these here. Um, Mitali wants to know if you have tips if it's um, if there's only a single founder of the company, so just just one person. How do you handle the pitch? I've been there, um, and it's really tough. My first company, I was the sole founder, and it, it really bothered me for many years. I didn't have a, you know, a, a partner, um, and so we do look for the team. Um, we do look for, you know, the Larry and Sergey, right? You know, we want that dynamic duo, the product guy or the, 
the CEO and the CTO team. Um, but if you don't have it, um, you know, it's not a deal breaker. It's just, uh, you know, it's just, in my opinion, being like having both scenarios, I always prefer to have a partner. They're hard to find. Okay, and we it's also, also a lot riskier for, for investors to um, to invest in a, you know in a one person company as opposed to a founding team. Um, you know, just just because you're just you know relying on one person, um, and uh, and and things can go wrong. So it, it does add more risk. Um, I've I've been told many many times that that investors um, do uh, really really want a um, a team of at least two. So you should be looking for you should be looking for someone to um, to complement your skills. So if you're a technologist, you should be someone you know who's going to be a good spokesperson and good sales and marketing person, for example, or, or an operations person. Great, thanks. And then a question from Anne here. She wants to know what's the worst pitfall of all to avoid, and and she said specifically, what's the biggest turnoff when someone is pitching to you, Mark? Yeah, I was. Just last night, writing or help writing an ethics guide for a, for an incubator, um, and look, I think honesty, you know, integrity, trust is probably the base of everything, right? In any relationship you have, you know, personal, business, and, and so I think you know, telling the truth um, and, and 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 asking for help, uh, and investors don't. Think you know everything, and they understand their money comes with help. Um, and you know, you mentioned earlier that you often want to appeal to that as an entrepreneur. I mean, seek out investors that can help you beyond the, the money they put in your bank account because you're going to need it. Um, and so, you know, I think the most important thing as an entrepreneur is not to show, you know integrity and honesty to the investors, but to yourself as well. Um. Okay, and then maybe one more question here before we move on to the next slide. Um, Peter wants to know, what, what if a, one of your members of the founding team is located in another country? How, how does that reflect on, on the team? Will that impact how you're viewed? Uh, the first answer is we like to have the founding team in one country. We don't mind which country it is. And we've got investments in Greece, Sydney, uh, the Philippines, here on the east and the west coast. So for us, it's about where the core engineering team is. Um, but it's just two weeks ago, I passed on a deal because the founder was here and his two engineers were offshore and they weren't here in the US. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it's a, either or. You've got to have um, a team in one place because it'll just get the product out the gate faster and you can build a company better. Okay, great. Thanks. So to go to market slide, um, Again, this you know you've built the product or you've got a solution. You've shown the investors you know, how scalable it is and how defensible it is, and, um, and now it's like, right, well, how are you guys going to get this uh, your team to how are you going to put it in the hands of customers? Or and so you know again, it's a slide that should go in the deck. Um, it you know are you going direct? Are you going through partnerships? Are you selling online? Are you doing advertising? Are you uh, you know how are you blocking and tackling? Right, and it's usually a multi-stage answer. It's like we are going to start with putting, you know, uh, college students, uh, you know, with our product, and we're going to go to these ten universities around the states, and then it's going to go viral, and then we're going to work on the next the go-to-market strategy, or we're going to work, you know, we're only going to sell online because it's cheaper, and then in, you know, a year when we get to this milestone, we're going to look for partnerships. So I think the distribution go to market slide is it's pretty simple. Just shows that you've thought through um, how you're going to get your product out, and you're not just you know, thinking about product revisions. Um, you're thinking about go to market and so on. Yeah, and, and as part of the go to market, I, I think one of the follow up questions you're going to have to be prepared to answer is sort of the the cost. Um, you may not have precise metrics, but 
you should be prepared um, to answer questions about how, you know, uh, which ones are more leverageable and which ones are more labor and cost intensive because uh, obviously that's going to be a huge um, driver of your expense line as the company grows. Yeah, the next slide is the competitive matrix. Hugely important. Um, why? For the venture capitalists, this is where we spend all our time. Um, you know, looking at the competitors, reading TechCrunch, uh, setting up Google Alerts, finding out who your competitors are and analyzing them. How much money they've raised, how big they are, are they really, you know, in, in your sector? Um, so I think to Jim's point before, having competitors is a good thing. It validates the market. Um, you know, often we look for deals that are lower price in valuation uh, with traction um, that have competitors that have, you know, are further along or slightly different or have raised more money. Um, so don't feel it's because you're you know, second or third or fourth in the queue to start a company. It's not that you. you you're not going to be competitive. I mean, I always use the example of Google. I mean, you know, by 1999, who needed another search engine? We had dozens of these. And so, you know, I think having a very crisp competitive matrix um, shows that you're informed, you're in touch with your competitors and a little bit about their, you know, maybe their product plan. It also gives you an awesome opportunity to say, this is how our product or solution differs, is better, needs work, you know, isn't as good, this is why we're raising money, because we need to improve on these three or four, you know, components to compete at the next level with our competitors. So this is one way of providing a, a competitive matrix. Um, I think there's a couple more. Um, this is a classic sort of quotient chart. I see this a little bit. It's often easier to understand. Um, again, pictorially, it can be simple. It can show, you know, not just on a X, Y axis or a matrix. It shows spatially how you're in a field or a sector or, or of your your own. Um, and then perhaps there's one more, and, and there's not. So, on to revenue projections. Um, there's a couple of ways that you should think about revenue projection. Um, I always like to see three or four years of financials. I think breaking it down into top line revenue, you know, operating expenses. I like this slide because it, um, it 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 talks to the revenue projection should talk to slide slide six, which is the go to market, right? We've got direct and indirect or self service, and you know these are our operating expenses. The three main buckets, you know, staff, um, admin, incidental, incidentals, capex. Um, and I always like to see what the you know, EBITDA or the negative um, cash flow will look like because that starts to give you an idea of the, the amount of money that you should be raising. Right? So the amount of money you're raising or asking for should match what your burn rate is in that sort of you know, negative EBITDA row. And I always like to see the head count so I can run a quick calculation, two things. One, head count to revenue and head count to expense. Um, and that's just an internal comparable that I always like to do. And um, so you know, you probably got some good advice on projections and how early growth does it for a lot of your startup companies. Yeah, I I do and, and, and really you know we focus on two things, right? We talk about tops down projections and we talk about bottoms up projections and, and, and there's places for both. You know, on the revenue side obviously, you know, using the analyses that, that Mark has already indicated, you know, where you top start with a, a TAM or a total available market and you and you funnel it down um, to, you know, what you're gonna be able to, you know, gain in the first year or two, um, and then projecting that out is the way to go, obviously, especially early on if you don't have a lot of history um, to rely on. Um, on the operating expenses and the, the customer acquisition costs um, and things of that nature, I really, really push for bottoms up projections so that you you understand, you know, the, the people that it's going to take to hit those numbers, the revenue numbers, um, what it actually costs um, to uh, acquire a customer um, and projecting that out and, and doing it from a bottoms up perspective. And that, you know, does two things. One, it gives you a better understanding 
understanding of, of how you're going to approach this. Um, and then two, um, it uh, allows you to answer those tough questions when the, when the due diligence comes around um, and, and, and investors ask those questions. Um, you, they, they are going to be looking at not only um, is the model feasible, but also, do you as the entrepreneur, do you as the CEO, um, understand the economics and understand um, your model um, and can communicate it properly? Um, and 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 because you obviously have to be able to understand it before you can execute on it. We we have a question here from Lee. If uh, if you don't mind, he wants to know if you include assumptions on this slide as well, or would you just discuss them? I, I would not include assumptions at, at this stage. You obviously, when you're putting together the model, the model is going to be based more on the assumptions, and the rest of the actual numbers um, are, are just a byproduct of those assumptions. You should know those assumptions cold. You should be able to speak to them, but I certainly wouldn't necessarily be putting them onto a pitch deck slide. You should have those as backups. Yeah, I often tell people put them as an appendix so that if, again, that's going to be one of the questions people ask you can refer them to it and it'll be uh, you know accessible to them but it won't interrupt the flow of the the main presentation great that that actually leads to some other related questions we have here i, I think um some folks are wondering like how long should this presentation take and you know well let, let's start with that one how how long should it, your presentation take yeah i always queue it up for 30 minutes Right, so you've got these sort of 15, 12 to 15 slides that you know, one to two minutes per slide, and you know, shoot for 30, 30 minutes, and then if you feel the meeting's going well, um, you know, you, you you can always expand it. But I think if you if the investor knows that you're going to get through it in 30 minutes, they feel it's, it's a good, efficient use of your time, and you can get through your pitch deck in 30 minutes. So if, if, if someone only had, say, 10 minutes, they're wondering, what would be the slides you would suggest they do include? What would be the key yeah, slides? And I, yeah, I critique a lot of these slides for, you know, I've been mentoring for different, different accelerators around the valley. And uh, it's definitely, um, so I would go for, uh, obviously, the first slide, problem, first slide, problem, solution, team, and then I would have, um, market, financial projections, use of funds, seven slides, one minute, six to, six to eight minutes if you're on one of those pitch competitions. Perfect. Great. And, and then a last related question to that too. Uh, People are wondering, or Emily's wondering, should the deck stand on its own w without you pitching it? She's saying like they often use theirs, um, they're a nonprofit, they use their deck in marketing packets, but they don't walk the prospect through it in a meeting. It, would this be the same sort of structure if you're just sending it to someone, or would there be different considerations? Great. Look, great question. Uh, try not to send the entire deck if someone wants to read it in its entirety. Um, there's a lot of busy VCs that will look at even warm, warmly introduced investment opportunities get looked at with the deck only, you know, i.e. they don't take a call or a meeting. Um, so one, I would, wouldn't put all the information in there if you're just sending a deck over the email um, because they may not absorb it, they just want to get a sense of what it is. Uh, is, is there real revenue growth, what the team's like, what the market is. I'd probably keep the four or five slides and say this is a high level slide, happy to go into it in more detail. Right? And so you might in that instance have the first slide, you know, the about us slide or the management slide, uh, solution and uh, you know, some revenue numbers or traction. Um, yeah, that's how I would play that. Great, that's helpful, thank you. Um, and one of the, the parts of the, if you're selling a widget, I always talk about unit economics. Um, if, 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 you know, gross market, the rule of thumb often is there's got to be a 3x, you know, times um, the cost of acquisition that needs to go into a, the long time value. Another way of saying that is, you know, if I sell a product at uh, $10, uh, will it cost me $3? To, to get into the customer's hands. So 
you know, if you're selling a product or a, or a low cost item, you want to talk about unit economics, and obviously your accountants can can help you do that. But just another way of showing projections, which is you know graphs. It's again, um, VCs get jaded by a lot of numbers. Uh, keeping information in an easily digestible, visible way is a good idea, and just using colours. Um, you know, different colours to show if you've got multi-revenue uh, line items and just make it easy for the investor to go, okay, so you're a SaaS company and you're going to get most of your revenue from SaaS. Great, it's scalable. So, um, Mark, I absolutely love uh, this the, this format in terms of presenting you know what the opportunity is as, as well as and it just captures in, in a visual basically the, the most important information that investors want to know so you know I, I, I would highly encourage you know if your if your financial model makes sense to present it in this manner to to, to, to do so even even better than even the uh, the, the, um, the, the uh, chart form or the um, table form. And back to the management slide, you know, if you don't have a lot of management on board because you're a one or two person startup, uh, having advisors is a good idea. I'm a big fan of them because it can be very lonely being an entrepreneur. Uh, you want it, you want confidence, you want a shoulder to cry on, you want a technology guy who's got deep uh, understanding of you know building building out. Um, you may want a, a, an attorney. They're fantastic mentors. Uh, and, and introduce, introduce you to people as well as uh, people that have also done it before. Uh, and this is a real slide of a company that raised a couple of million dollars now and they came out of AngelPad. Um, and uh, you know, this is a real advisor slide. So you know, I always say, draw a circle as an entrepreneur, do your pizza slice and say, if I had six people, who would they be? How can they really help me from an engineering product distribution? You know, uh, legal and uh, um, scale perspective and put some names down. I always say to people, look, try and find advisors that you personally like as well as professionally you can benefit from. Give them a little bit of stock, maybe between you know one tenth of one percent to you know a quarter of one percent of, of your stock option pool, lock them in for 12, 24 months, set objectives, uh, as I always do in our advisor agreements for portfolio companies, you'll provide you know, half a day a month, you'll provide X introductions, you'll agree to meet. Um, so there's, there's got to be some, uh, um, for the advisory stock that you're giving them, and you want to have some demonstrable and quantitative um, results from your advisors, not just, hey, let's catch up and have coffee. But I think most importantly, your advisory team is you're in a council that aren't necessarily your board of directors made up of venture capitalists and other management team. They're people you can talk to about a range of things, at a personal level, at a professional level. Um, so just some insight there on the advisors. And, and just a question of clarification from Andre. He wants to know if your board of directors you would put on your advisor slide or on your team slide. Um, it, it usually goes on your team slide, and it's probably, you know, an, if not their profile, just you know, these are our existing investors, right? Um, it's not necessary to to put their profile or their picture of, of you know, the partner of the VC firm. Perhaps just the the the, the, the logo of the firm is sufficient. Okay. And then, you know, ask for the money, right? I mean, just your classic case of you are pitching an investment opportunity, and I think I at least want to know how much you're raising at what valuation. And then, you know, obviously, the use of proceeds, how you're going to spend it. And if it's, you know, half a million to a million dollars, we kind of get it's going to go a little bit on product, a bit on CapEx and OpEx, and, you know, you're going to get used over 12, 18 months. Um, but definitely I think it's a good idea to put up front how much you're raising. Um, of, often the valuation is nebulous and you know, we look for, if, you're, if a venture capital firm's not going to lead it or you're asking for a lead investor, 
terms aren't set. Uh, other smaller investors will want to see a term sheet, which you know, to Jim you might give some insight on, on drafting term sheets and valuations. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so a couple things on this. Yeah, if, if, um, if you're pitching seed investors, I'd probably have a separate term sheet with the terms rather than trying to summarize it on here, although you could. Um, but having a term sheet that you could leave behind uh, that would be separate and apart from the deck, I think, is, is a good way to do it. Um, I have a lot of clients that really don't have a good idea of, of what their um, valuation is going to be and are realistic in terms of recognizing that the market's going to set the price. Um, but I, I, what I tell people is from, you know, seed rounds are all over the place, but if you're going for an A round or even a B round, you know, with a venture capital firm, you're, you're going to be giving up any, at least 20% and maybe even as high as 35 or 40% of the round uh, of your company to get to get a meaningful round done, and you know you can go look at the stats, but there's a, there's several places that they exist. You know that that holds true whether you're using two million or twelve million, and so the amount that you ask for is the, the lower amount. Um, you're going to get less money and probably give up more dilution. So you need to have a realistic sense of what is the right amount of money to raise. Okay, it's three million dollars. Don't say, well, we're only going to raise $1 million now because we think the valuation is going to be too low and then we're going to raise $2 million later. That's probably not the right way to approach what your ask is. But your advisors, including your counsel, um, can help you size a round because the critical thing for a round is it should get you to the next value inflection point um, where um, you're not raising money every six months. Uh, but you're also having achieved milestones that enable you to justify a step up in the valuation um, a as well as justify the money as for what the next phase of the business is going to do. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that too, and, and I think uh, uh, Jim just made a great point. So I think, you know, when, when, when I look at financial planning um, for, for fundraising, this is kind of what I look at. I look for, um, as Mark mentioned, a 12 to 18 month runway. So putting together your financials, understanding your numbers, understanding how much you're going to be burning over a 12 to 18 month period as you develop the market is really, really critical. Obviously, give yourself a little bit of cushion um, because we will do pivots and, and things will get delayed. but. Look for that 12 to 18 months of runway. I obviously um, would recommend 18 um, over 12 because it takes probably six months to fundraise, and the last thing you want to be doing is is after you you, ra you raise around the financing, um, six months later start the process all over again. So if you can raise 18 months of, of, of runway, um, and then and then to, to Jim's point, milestones, 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 right? Because the value of your company is not linear; it's not a curve. It will take step function. Um, uh, um, uh, increases hopefully um, and it's going to be based upon you hitting some significant milestones so you know if you can kind of combine okay what are the milestones that I can hit in the 12 to 18 months what's the runway what's the cash burn that I'm going to need to get to those milestones so that the next round of financing is going to be at an appreciably greater um, uh, number um, then I think you've probably done a good job of, of, uh, of at least modeling out um, on the front end you know what you should be asking for And the last slide is the exit strategy. And I know entrepreneurs may not want to put this slide in uh, because they don't, just don't know it's too early. Uh, and I'm, so it's an optional slide. I like to see it because I want to think about, oh, do I know someone at Cisco or Fox Sports that I can ring and ask about you know, this particular uh, you know, software as it been done before? Do they know what are the likelihood of this being important and relevant? And so, you know, it's an optional slide, but it, um, it, it shows the investors that you're at least thinking that, that you know, you want to sell the company and return their money with a, with a, with a, uh, a premium. So thanks very much, and I think we're pretty much on top of the hour, Erica. <laughs> we are, we are. So I think we got through most of our questions. If we didn't answer your question, we, we will follow up. Um, but we're going to try and end on time here. So thank you so much um, for joining us for today's webinar. We really appreciate everyone's time and hope you found this to be useful.
If you have any additional follow-up questions, um, you see the contact information here on the slide, so feel free to reach out to any of our presenters today. Or you can also tweet the follow-up questions to at Early Growth FS with winning pitch, and we'll re respond um, via Twitter. And uh, we also hope you'll consider joining us for our next free webinar, which is on September 11th. If you're starting to think about growing your team, um, this is a good one. It's how to attract top talent, transforming your startup into a talent magnet with panelists from Wells Fargo Insurance, Hopkins and Carly, Premier Staffing, and Early Growth Financial Services. You can visit our events page to register for this event and check out other upcoming calendar events. So on that note, thanks again so much to Mark, um, Jim, and Sirk. Great presentation. Thank you all, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Jim and Sirk. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you, Jim. Bye-bye now.